This Elegoo Mars 2 Pro has been a faithful partner on my resin printing journey. But I've got one gripe with it. It's not quite big enough for resin printing video game cartridge shells. And also, it's getting a bit dirty because resin printing is a mucky old business. We will be keeping its partner in crime however, and this is the Elegoo Mercury Plus Washing and Curing Station. I think this will be okay for most of my needs. Some people have asked me about my resin printing process, so I thought I'd demonstrate it today. And it's a good opportunity because we're replacing this Mars 2 with a Mars 3. And just to be really contrary, although I've gone to a larger print size, we're going to be printing the smallest thing I can think of. The Panasonic 3DO has an issue with its drive where one of the nylon gears shrinks over time and splits. The gear is buried deep within the drive, so we might not get time to replace it in this video, but we will be able to see if we can replicate it. And this is one of the original split gears. Sizing up at around 8.8 millimeters in diameter, it's a tiny challenge for our bigger printer. So why don't you join me on a resin printing journey right now? Mark fixes stuff. This channel is sponsored by PCBWay, and they don't just do PCBs. If you want professional 3D printing, just upload your models, pick from a variety of materials and colors, and you're on your PCBWay. Thanks to Elaine and the PCBWay team for supporting Mark Fix's stuff. I'd like to say a big thanks to Elegoo for sending this printer over. It's an MSLA 3D printer, with MSLA meaning Mass Stereolithography Apparatus. This is the M3 and not the M3 Pro, although there's very little difference in output. Mass stereolithography means that there's a UV source that cures resin, but that's blocked by an LCD screen that turns the pixels on and off on the screen. Then what happens is it builds up layers by turning the pixels on and off and moving the print platform up and down. Just a little warning here, I don't usually film in this area, so the table's a bit wobbly and so's the floor. It's a loose floorboard. Apologies in advance for my wobbly bits. Opening up the box, the Elegoo looks absolutely beautiful with its ruby red lid, well packed inside its box with all of its accessories. The first accessory is the power line, which we'd call the power cable. I'm expecting that this is probably what we'd call in the UK a kettle lead. Let's have a look. Yes, as expected, it's a UK plug with a kettle lead. Looks pretty well manufactured, although it looks like it's a 13 amp fuse, which is really high for this. There's also the ubiquitous little square manual that you get of Elegoo products. To be honest, I'd rather have these digitally and save a tree. But it does show us helpfully what's in the accessories box, then let's have a look at that next. I think it's down here. This does suspiciously look like the candidate. Okay, so let's whip through what we've got inside the accessories box. A PSU. And this is rated at 24 volts at 3 amps. It only draws 2 amps from the main, so that 13 amp fuse is probably well over. I'll be tempted to change that. The usual bag of hex keys and spare bolts. A couple of paper paint filters. This is for putting resin back into the bottle out of the tank that you haven't used. I find these difficult to use. I actually prefer using one of these. This is a similar strainer, but it's metal, easier to wash, reusable, and better for the environment. A scraper for scraping gunk off of the FEP. That's the film at the bottom of the tank. And everybody knows what these are. These are face masks, but these have a charcoal layer. Resin can be quite toxic and cause allergies, so I'll be using the masks and these gloves that seem to be giving us the finger. There's a wallpaper scraper for getting your prints off of the build plate. And also what looks like a Cheetu Box Pro license. I'm not sure how long this is for, but it's probably nice to have. I've never tried the Pro version. Nice pair of side cutters. These are for removing the supports from your print. Yeah, they're pretty nice actually. 
And last in the box, we have the ever common USB key. This will probably have the Rook, which is the sample print and a copy of the manual on it. I have about 20 million USB keys and I've lost them all. Let's get the printer out of the box. And just a final check shows there's nothing left inside. There's just one twist tie at the bottom of the bag that holds the bag in place. And underneath we find a bit more packing. There doesn't seem to be any damage to the printer, so let's unpack a bit more. I'm moving quite slowly here so I don't wobble the floorboard and wobble the camera. I think full disclosure is good, so you know what's going on. Okay, so the rest of this plastic just seems to be for protecting the ruby red case. And this foam will be protecting the Z axis. And here we go. The Z axis on these printers is like a long worm screw or an auger that just turns and the build platform moves up and down. And this is the build platform. If I can get it out, that is. There we go. And it's a sandblasted plate that the resin adheres to. They've stuck to the old design, which I quite like. Under this piece of foam, we can see the Z axis build plate attachment and the resin tank. The resin tank seems to be held in by two screws, which is really good. On the previous model, there were these L brackets that cave over the top, and it was quite difficult to slide the tanks in and out. But these two screws actually look like they might be a bit more practical. Yeah, I like that. The resin tank itself is made of metal. It's really solid. A nice robust tank gives you a, a good weight for when you're carrying your resin around, before you throw it all over the carpet, of course. Pre-installed, we've got the fluorinated ethylene propylene film. Underneath the usual one million bolts holds the FEP film in place. This does feel like a nice bit of kit. Underneath this glass panel, we've got our LCD display that blocks the UV light and we've got our UV light source. We must remember to take off this film before we print, otherwise our prints will come out blurry and rubbish. I quite like that there's four bolts that are protruding out the bottom of this and they actually lock into four holes on the printer, which is nice. Let's power up our printer and make sure it turns on. Cool. That was a bit of a wait, but a jolly good start as it comes up with the Mars 3 logo. The first thing I always check on these MSLA printers with screens is that the screen is working and doesn't have any missing pixels. There's usually a function called exposure. This function will usually throw up a test screen or the manufacturer's logo. In this case, it's the Elegoo logo and their website address. I can see there's no missing pixels, so I'm pretty happy with that. Let's crack on with setting up. The build plate has a film on which needs to be removed as well. Again, this feels like a solid item, which is something you really want when you're printing. Resin printing isn't cheap. Having a firm set of equipment in your hands can really help to build your confidence. One of the first gotchas out of the box is that the build plate won't easily fit on the Z-axis strut. It's much, much easier, rather than trying to force it on, to raise the platform a small amount. Here we're selecting 10 millimeters and we're gonna spam this button until we get a nice distance between the platform mount and the screen. We don't want to scratch it. And I think that will do. Popping our build plate into position, we tighten up the hand screw to make sure that it's not going to fall off. Lovely. Now we need to level the plate. We want it as flat as possible to the screen and not tilted to one side, towards the back or the front. To do this, we loosen off these two hex bolts using the supplied hex key. I was going to joke that I've usually lost these by now, but it actually took me a good 20 minutes to find where I put these down. 
and they are actually on the table next to the printer all along. You can loosen off the bolts in any order. Once the plate drops down and you can move it side to side and left and right, you know you're ready to start doing the levelling process for the build plate. There's something strangely compelling and hypnotic about this. Anyway, to get the required gap, we need a sheet of A4 paper, just standard printer paper, underneath between the build plate and the screen. With this in place, we press the home button to make the head go down to the limit switch. This is the level of accuracy you need, you don't have to worry too much. Likewise, with the build plate, try to get it as square as possible to the screen, but a couple of degrees out either way doesn't matter because there's enough room within the tank, so don't worry too much. I'm trying to stay out the way of the camera here, but really you're meant to hold the plate flat to the screen whilst you do these bolts up to stop it moving. I've never really found this necessary, but I guess some people must, otherwise it wouldn't be in the manual. You should do the front bolt and then the side bolt in that order. With that done, you try to pull the paper out, and if it doesn't come out, then you need to raise the bed platform. We're going to select 0.1 of a millimetre and hit the button once. I still can't pull the paper out easily, so I'm going to hit it again, which actually equates to 0.2 millimetre, which is roughly the thickness of an A4 sheet of paper. This creates the gap we need for our first layer of resin to form when it's cured by the UV. With our build plate in the right position, we need to go and set Z to zero. This saves to the EEPROM the position that our build plate is in currently, and it tells the printer to go there whenever we start a print. If you forget this part of the process, you won't be able to print very well. With our build plate set up, it's time to set up the resin tank. I've just had another thought about these. These little bolts, with them being proud, means that when you put it down on a surface, then it won't scratch the FEP film, which is really nice. Now we need to raise the build plate so that we can put our resin tank on the printer. Again, I'm just spamming the button like crazy. It's lovely that these bolts actually lock the tank in position. It was something I wasn't sure about with the 2 Pro. But I'm absolutely sure that this is in the right position now because the bolts really confirm that. One downside to only having bolts and something I've seen reported on Reddit is that if you don't do them up, you can find the first layer sticks to the build plate and then your resin tank goes on a journey up and down ad infinitum. Not desirable. It's nice that the red transparent lid is so well protected, but I can tell you from experience, this is going to stay nice for about 10 seconds after we start our first print. And finally, with a satisfying peel, this printer's ready to rock and roll. But we will need something to print, so let's jump over to the computer, where I'm looking at the Assembler Games Evil Paul 3DO gear. This is one that I've printed using FDM in the past, and it worked. The only problem is that the inside hole wasn't tight enough. We had to use glue to get it to fit on the shaft. So I thought I'd hop over to Tinkercad, and I've added a shim inside to make my hole a little bit tighter. But then I went back onto Thingiverse and found that Robert Dale Smith, someone whose work has appeared on the channel before, has already remixed Evil Paul's cog. So it seems silly to, well, reinvent the cog. And as you can see, Robert's hole is a lot tighter than Paul's. Then I jumped into Chitubox and laid six of the cogs out and made them slightly different size variations in case of resin shrinkage. I'm not sure which one will be the best, but we'll find out. Auto supports didn't really work very well, so I chose to do them manually so they didn't attach to the side of the cogs. That looks pretty good, so I replicated it for all six of the cogs. The resin we're going to be using is this engineering light resin. I've used it before and it's really, really tough. Early resins were quite brittle and that's no good for mechanical parts, but I'm confident that this will work. I've also purchased another sandblasted build plate. This is quite good if you want to do multiple jobs one after the other. In addition to this, I also purchased a couple of extra resin tanks. 
This is nice because instead of having to empty your resin tank every time you want to change resin, you can swap the tanks out and store the resin in the tanks themselves. I'm surprisingly good at this. Let's pop the gloves on. These are actually latex gloves, so be warned if you have an allergy. You can smell them as soon as you open the bag. The smell, however, did remind me to put a mask on. Why does this look so wrong? Yep, the other hand looks just as wrong. <laughs> Let's fill our resin tank. This resin's actually discontinued. In fact, it's only got a month left on its sell-by date. I'm sure it'll be fine though. I've used resins that are really, really out of date before now with no ill effects. I hate these rings on things. I always feel like I'm gonna throw resin everywhere. I prefer to use a stick or something and then use it to pull the plug out of the bottle. And with our bottle uncorked, it's time for the sexy resin pouring shot which I believe is a legal requirement in resin printing videos. No matter how careful you are, you will drop resin everywhere. Be warned, there's a drip on the table already. This is why you should always use these slap mats. They're just basically silicon mats that you can lay all over the place. But I didn't want to ruin my sexy shot. Another safety aspect is that resin absolutely honks and it's quite bad for you to breathe it. I've got my charcoal filter unit running in the background here and you can actually feel the breeze. In fact, it's so good that when the lid's on, you can't smell the resin at all. Powering on. There's our logo. And once the machine started up properly, we'll pop our USB stick in and press the print button. Inside the print list, we can see our job and identify it easily because it's got a nice little preview. I'll turn the lights out so you can see. And let's press print. And with the lights back on, let's do a really boring time lapse. It's boring because the cogs we're printing will never actually come out of the resin because they're too small. I didn't think this through, did I? Sorry, everyone. Although when it's printed, we do get a sexy pull out shot. Look at that, so drippy. And we can start to see the fruits of our labors appearing on the underside of the build plate. For any resin printer, this is a real heart in your mouth moment because you're never sure if your product is on the build plate or stuck to the FEP film in the tank. But that looks pretty good. A low angle shot can show us that all six of our cogs are actually present and correct, if a little bit drippy. Now I said I was going to show you my resin printing process and it's this really. I take my stuff and I pop it into a bucket of IPA first. I'm still using IPA washable resin. I haven't switched over to water washable. This is where I noticed that the Mars 3 build plate, well, it's quite a bit bigger than the Mars 2 Pro build plate. Usually I put the whole build plate into the IPA, but that's actually impossible now. So I pop the print off of the plate, clean the tip of my tool, and then stand there looking confused with the cameras rolling. <sighs> Didn't think this through, did I? In the end, I get the build plate as clean as I can. And I think to myself that I need a bigger primary wash container. Anyway, my process is usually a primary wash to get most of the resin off in a bucket. Then when I've got most of the resin off, I'll move that out of the way and I can use my wash and cure station, which will agitate any remaining resin on the part. And don't be fooled, there is still resin on here. I can see it globbing around the fins of the gears. Now we've printed, we can put the cover on top of the printer. The red color isn't a coincidence, it's actually this color, so it blocks UV light and stops the resin from curing inside the printer. Okay, so we really do need to wash this, so I'm gonna show you my wash and cure station. Please bear in mind, this is the older model, the Mercury Pro, and because of that, I won't be able to fit the build plate from the Mars 3 in. Usually you can suspend the build plate inside these, which it will do with the Mars 2, but it won't with the Mars 3. So we're going to use the basket. To 
be honest, for 99% of the prints I do, this is still going to be perfect. Popping the part into the basket, we'll be able to set it for multiple minutes of washing. Once we press start, there's fins inside the tank which agitate the IPA using a cyclonic action. This actually reverses over time as well, so it does get into every nook and cranny of the part. You can overwash your parts, so do be careful. With our washing done, we can take it out of the machine. Lifting up our basket, again we notice just how bloody messy resin printing can be. You'll notice I'm still wearing gloves. That's because you shouldn't handle uncured resin, even if it's been washed. With that in mind, let's cure our part. This is the curing plate and it fits magnetically to the curing station. We switch into curing mode, set our time, and pop our part onto the plate. I won't show you every angle, but I will rotate it and turn it over a few times and set it to cure some more. Again, you can over cure a part. Different resins have different curing settings. With this engineering resin, it's pretty difficult to over cure a part, but if you're doing something in say a transparent resin, you can make it go yellowed or you could ruin the surface. It's something you learn with experience. Well, I, I'd like to know your name And I, I've got your private number, baby Oh, sorry. Yep, these are looking pretty good. And out of abundance of caution, even though I've cured these a few times, I'm still wearing gloves, which actually makes it really bloody difficult to show you as I tear them off of the supports. If you were using one of the more brittle resins, these supports would be snapping off. As you can see, there's a good flexibility to even the supports. These cogs look really good, and they're definitely not brittle. If these don't fit, then we can work from what we've got here to make some that do fit, by scaling them up or scaling them down. Now this video is long enough, so I think that we'll fit it into the drive in another video. Big thanks to Eligu for supplying this machine, I'm really grateful. And an even bigger thanks to my amazing patrons appearing on the screen right now. If you'd like to join the Mark Fixes Stuff crew and help me create even more of these videos, then please go to patreon.com forward slash Mark Fixes Stuff. In return, you'll get early access to all my videos, with all the ads removed. I also make a patron vlog, which is for patrons only. And don't forget, you'll get access to the patron exclusive channel on my Discord. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have enjoyed this, tell others. If you haven't, don't tell anybody. Bye.